Welcome to the Juliana Forlano Show. I'm Juliana Forlano. Happy to be coming to you live from City College. Happy to be here on WBAI in the studio with me, Catherine Davis, host of Heart of Mind from right here on WBAI, 1 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Coming up on the show, we're going to be talking to Dr. Reese Halter. He's a distinguished conservation biologist. And we're going to be talking to him about what is happening in the oceans. Pretty scary. Going to try not to get all depressed by the end of it. And then, guess what? We have a second hour in which we're going to talk about economics. And it's pledge drive time, so we're going to be begging you for money. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Juliana Forlano, listening to the Juliana Forlano Show. Catherine Davis, the one and only from Heart of from Heart of Mind. That's me. Thank you for joining me today. Well, I'm really happy to be here. I'm hoping I can keep that energy up. I'm kind of laid back. You're a relaxed Zen person. That's, I am. It's good. Maybe we'll ask you after we're all depressed <laughs> when we talk about what's happening in the oceans. That's funny. We're going to move on to um, some of the content we have for tonight. A couple of news stories, breaking news stories. Um, check this out. This is great news. An official with Greece's newly elected Syriza party. I think I'm saying that properly. Syriza party may have sounded the death knell For a proposed EU-U.S. trade deal, everyone's talking about trade these days and how it's these trade deals are just going to tank the middle class and ruin the uh, environment uh, along with it. Anyway, these new anti-austerity folks in Greece have basically said, no, we're not we're not signing that. The deal that they're talking about is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It's now face, it's now it's in its eighth round of talks between negotiators. And mind you, these are closed door talks. These are talks between folks who are with the biggest corporations who would benefit the most, uh, not the people. They don't have any union leaders in there, I'll tell you that much. And uh, and from some of the trade deals that we've been talking about on our show, there's not even any elected officials uh, in there. Anyway, Georgios Katogrokalos, I apologize, now Deputy Minister for Administrative Reform, confirmed what he had told newspapers ahead of his Syriza Party's victory last week, that his parliament will not ratify that trade deal. Here's a quote. He says, I can assure you that a parliament where Syriza holds the majority will never ratify the deal. And this will be a big gift not only to the Greek people, but to all the European people. And he said this on Monday. That's a huge deal. That's huge. Uh, Syriza's coalition partner also appears to share the anti-TTIP views. Euroactive is reporting this, saying it means that Greeks could issue a veto and threaten to block the entire deal. Excellent. It it just takes the one guy, you know, well, Mm -hmm. all the Greeks who voted, every Greek who voted these people in, and then one guy to stand up and say, no, we're not we're not doing this. This is completely unjust. So so it does. All the hard work of progressives is paying off. I'm grateful for that. A little closer to home and a little farther from being progressive, Chris Christie. His recent jaunts on the Dallas Cowboy owner Jerry Jones's private plane prompted a state ethics inquiry. And the Justice Department tightened its rules on travel after a report found that New Jersey taxpayers picked up the tab for $8,146 for Christy, his wife, and two aides to travel to the 2013 Super Bowl and to stay in New Orleans for three days. What? That's a lot. And to top it off, the governor's entourage partied with Bono at three parties hosted by King Abdullah of Jordan, including a champagne reception in the desert during a 2012 trip. The king picked up Christie's hotel tab, which was $30,000. Now, I'm not making a fat joke, but that is a lot of minibar. I'm just saying. That $30,000, you can have at least two Toblerones on that kind of price. That's amazing. Are you sure that's not illegal? Uh, It is. Well, it's funny you should ask, Kath. That's fascinating. You know, it it is legal for governors to have their travel and expenses paid by foreign governments thanks to an executive order that Christie signed for his own state in 2010. So he rewrote the laws... To fit his own 
lifestyle. Now, I would like to go to a party with Bono. So if anyone, if that's something, call in 212-209-2950. Donate me going to a party with Bono. That would be fine. I mean, it just does show, it does goes to show. Goes to show that these people with money, who want to keep oil spewing and want to keep our environment dirty, they got enough money to to feed and house Chris Christie, and we we the progressives are asking you guys for donations, which we need to keep that pressure on these folks. And it, and it actually worked. We've got in Greece, we've got we've got a uh, progressive government. I'm excited about that. Well, I'm looking at oh, sorry, <laughs> okay. So here's another deal, another good news. A little good news before the bad news. I got a little bad news, but a little good news before the bad news. Obama has ordered all federal agencies to plan for climate change, which is a big deal. It means, hey, it's here. It's real. We're doing this. This happened on Friday. He issued an executive order requiring all federal agencies to incorporate scientific projections. Can you believe it? Science uh, for higher sea levels and increased flooding due to climate change. It is the policy of the United States to improve the resilience of communities and federal assets against the impacts of flooding. This is from the official order. These impacts are anticipated to increase over time due to the effects of climate change and other threats. Losses caused by flooding affect the environment, our economic prosperity, public health and safety, and our national security. All right. I I don't have my sound effects at hand today, but if I did, I would put the clapping for... Thank you. Yes, that's good. The whole group can do it together. (laughs) Yes. Kudos to President Obama for finally tying climate change to national security. This is a very important thing that could, you know, war hawks and war loving people, they love to fund wars and they love to talk about national security. And if we could tie climate change to national security, maybe we'll actually be able to mitigate against some of the things that are happening. Your thoughts, Kathy? Well, I think that that could happen. I believe that we're benefiting from Obama being in his lame duck presidency. I think we're going to see a lot of really great things coming out of the presidency now that he doesn't have to actually run for anything again. Yeah, and now that it's not likely that he's actually going to get any of this stuff through. Here's the thing with Obama. He gives me whiplash, right? He does this with the climate change. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, green groups are warning us that Obama's trade policy, the TPP, not the other one we just talked about, Mm -hmm. but the TPP is going to be a disaster for the environment. And we've been pounding away at this on the show for quite a while in the State of the Union address that hit a lot of great notes for labor and the middle class. Obama pushed one policy that has these green groups up in arms, which is fast tracking of trade deals. There was a letter sent this week to every member of Congress, environmental advocates, sent this letter warning that uh, two particularly far-reaching deals that are in the works would significantly weaken public health and environmental protection. The letter is signed by nearly 50 groups. They're, of course, talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we've been talking about here, and they that is the deal that uh, has Asian nations and Pacific nations, not including China and the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, uh, coming together for, for free trade. Everyone knows how that worked out. Remember the 80s? Remember the 90s? Not good. Uh, and then the uh, deal with Europe contains rules that would grant foreign corporations the right to sue governments in private tribunals over environmental, public health, and other laws and policies that corporations allege reduce the value of their investment. I believe someone once said, what is it, the love of money is the root of all evil? Well, I think we're seeing this. Anyway, These agreements contain rules that would require the United States Department of Energy to automatically approve exports of liquefied natural gas, i.e. increased fracking, to countries in the PACs with no analysis at all to determine whether exporting this gas is in the public interest. So it just basically takes the voters. That sounds very unfortunate, I must say. So perhaps Obama's new announcement about... Um, the environment is just a cover-up, a cover-over. You know, put a little blanket over the disaster he's creating this with is, this earlier you see, decision. You see, I think you might be right. This is so interesting. Um, so the administration is trying to rally the business lobby to get behind these trade deals, right? Even some of the people in business, they don't want these deals because they think it's going to undercut small small business. But, of course... 
some of the business lobby is for it. That's the same lobby, by the way, that 20 years ago supplied that needed push to make that NAFTA a, a thing. Uh, Caterpillar, the bulldozers people, got its employees to write 17,500 letters to members of Congress supporting Fast Track, which is the legislation that would allow uh, or call for a vote in Congress without any debate, without bringing it to public light, nothing. You just you have like a few hours and then you got to vote. And there is widespread support in the Republican Party. And Obama's going to say it's okay because this is Obama's idea. And there is some support with corporate Democrats also. But there is uh, people who are not supporting it, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. So we can't have it fast-tracked. This is very important. 17,500 letters from Caterpillar, the, the employees of Caterpillar, to their elected officials saying, we want this. That sounds very shady. The IBM has executives from all 50 states inviting members of Congress to tour plants that produce products that could be sold abroad. So they, the business lobby is lobbying for this. They want to open up markets. Anyway, it's bad. Keep your eyes on it, people. Call your Congress people and say you're against these fast tra- these trade deals. You're against fast track. Make your voice heard. We need one. You know, we need seventeen thousand people to call. So you, we definitely need you, listener. If you're actually, li- you know, if you're mm-hmm. able to dial the phone, please call your senator and say you're against it. All right, joining us on the phone. I'm very happy to have our next guest, Dr. Reese Halter, the distinguished conservation biologist, earth doctor, and award-winning broadcaster and voice for the preservation of ecology, joins us from California. Dr. Uh, Dr. Reese, thanks for joining us on the line. Juliana, thrilled to be with you and your listeners. Uh, New York City and you rock, baby. Thanks. <laughs> I am so glad to have you. I So I I told the listeners when I got back that, that I had just gone... To Australia, I had a lucky break, and my work got me to go to Australia. So it was really oh. awesome. And when I read your recent piece about how the Australian federal government is granting oil and oil companies the right to search for oil off the coast of the largest saltwater lagoon in the southern hemisphere, I got real mad, and I called you. Could you tell people what's going on? Yeah, look, uh, this is very, very serious. In my latest. Uh, my brand new book, Shepherding the Sea, The Race to Save Our Oceans, and uh, through all of the different portals, uh, MSNBC and elsewhere, what is happening, and it's a global crisis. Big oil, $2 trillion there being subsidized every year to kill our beautiful planet. From the Arctic and my friends, the narwhals, the the spiral-toothed male, Mm. beautiful uh, uh, whales, to Obama's recent capitulation on the eastern seaboard to open it up to to oil and gas exploration to the longest east-west coastline in the southern hemisphere, the Great Australian Bight, to off Lake Macquarie the largest saltwater lagoon in the southern hemisphere that goes into the Tasman Sea, they are, they are committing a seismic slaughter. So what happens is this, listeners, every 10 seconds nonstop for two months, 252 decibels of sonic cannons are booming in the ocean. And they're shattering the eardrums of millions of creatures because we're insatiably supporting this oil and gas craze. And it's, it's wrong. It's, it's ecocide. And I am so disappointed with our commander in chief for, for uh, allowing this. And of course, Australia is off the charts. They've got a, in my opinion, he's a neo-fascist, the, uh, the, uh, the leader, Tony Abbott. Mm, mm. Dr. Reese, let's just be clear here. When you shatter the eardrums of a sea marine mammal, you basically kill it because it loses its ability to navigate, not to Ab- mention absolute, the incredible ab- suffering that it goes through. Absolutely, and, and we, know, uh, we know this from Madagascar where 
the melon head, a uh, hundred melon head uh, uh, mm-hmm. whales stranded. They they strand themselves. We call this a mass stranding, and they they're finished, and they beach themselves, and and uh, and it's just it's so wrong. It's so wrong to kill the doctors of the sea. Look, the whales, the toothed whales, keep their populations of prey fit by culling the old, weak, and sick. They prevent diseases from becoming epidemics. The wonderful filter-feeding baleen whales, they feed deep in the oceans. These are like the blue whales, the fin whales, the humpbacked whales, the right whales, and others. And they feed deep down in the ocean on the phytoplankton. And as they rise, they release mega amounts of flocculent fecal plumes that are rich in nitrogen and iron. That provides fertilizer to grow phytoplankton, the base of the entire marine food chain that that makes abundance, that creates abundance in the fisheries. And... They fight their their massive fight, uh, uh, climate change fighting machines because that phytoplankton sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. There's been a worldwide moratorium since 1986 on not killing whales. Mm. There have been over 40,000 whales murdered since 1986, and most of them have been by Japan under the auspice of science which is absolute flummery. They haven't published one thing since 1986. They have been killing our oceans with a repugnant sense of entitlement that is wrong. It's evil. And the International Court of Justice in The Hague recently ruled that they are not performing science. And the Japanese whale poaching, ocean-killing whalers have turned around and said, we intend to go back into the Great Southern Ocean, into an international whale sanctuary, and commercially harvest. Do you know, Juliana, they're taking whale meat they got 6,000 tons of it stored in football field after football oh. field because the people aren't eating it, and they're turning these unbelievable sentient creatures into dog food. This is ecocide, and nobody except my brave, brave friends at Sea Shepherd, Sea Shepherd Australia, Sea Shepherd Global, are standing up to these ocean-killing poachers and saying enough is enough. Dr. Reese Halter, we're speaking to Dr. Reese Halter, a distinguished conservation biologist, an earth doctor, an award-winning broadcaster, and a voice for preservation ecology. Uh, Dr. Halter, I read recently something that I can't, I just, I read it a couple days ago and I almost can't talk about it because I find it so very disturbing as if what you just said wasn't all that disturbing. This is equally disturbing. Um, I read recently that the death rate for baby killer whales along the West Coast has been at 100 percent for the last three years, meaning there ha- every baby born has either been stillborn or has died. There is no reproduction happening uh, along the West Coast. And uh, basically, uh, even orcas, pregnant female orcas are dying before giving birth. One specifically died at age 18 which they live to like a hundred. So imagine like an 18, you know, an 18 year old has her first baby, then she can have one every year for the next however many years. And uh, so to have, you know, that particular female die with a stillbirth whale inside of her stomach uh, that was decomposing, that's a huge loss for uh, orcas and, and killer whales. Some of the speculation around what is causing that is um, poison, uh, toxic toxicity in the water, because, of course, whales are at the top of the food chain. So uh, the, the cycle of poisons concentrates as it moves up. And then also they are starving because they don't have enough food. Another, and this brings us right back to Japan, another uh, suggestion about why this is happening on the West Coast is that uh, water from Fukushima is radioactive and has been basically poisoning the whole of the Pacific Ocean. Do you have information about that? 
Well, what, what, what we can say, Juliana, again, it's in Shepherding the Sea, The Race to Save Our Oceans, my ninth, my latest book uh, that's just been released. What we can say in California is this. Prior to 2011, 97% of a grid off coast of California was vibrant. When, we, when my colleagues went back uh, last year, they found that almost 97% of the ocean floor is dead. We now now whether that is all Fukushima related or whether it's the three and a half million pieces of plastic every day going into the oceans and an estimated seven hundred million tons of plastic in the ocean that acts like a sponge uh, that is laced with. Uh, methyl mercury, DDT, PCBs, biphenol A's, phthalates, TBTs, which are anti-hull fouling paints, or insecticides, and everything in between, we're not quite sure yet. This we can say with assurity, Juliana, uh, with 100% assurity. The main reason we have to get away from coal is because of mercury poisoning. In the last in the last 50 years alone, mercury poisoning has tripled in our oceans to over 80,000 metric tons. Wow. The whales and the carnivorous sharks are doctors of the sea. Now, I put it to you this way and our listeners. If 90%, because 9 out of 10 sharks in our oceans are missing, we have slaughtered 660 million sharks in the last eight years, if we were missing 90% of our medical doctors in the United States of America, our economy would grind to a halt and our society as we, would, as we know it now would crumble. Mm. The oceans are being impoverished at, at a suicidal mass extinction rate. When the whales die, we die. If the oceans die, we die. Three out of every four breaths of air come from our oceans. And by the way, we're missing 40% of the phytoplankton that provides our oxygen, irrespective of where we live on the ocean. We're missing it. And 2024 is a number that we should all know, because that's when the United Nations say says that we will have the 8th billion person on Earth. There's 7.3 billion people now on Earth. 700 more million people. Where are they supposed to get oxygen? Climate disruption is very real. It is altering ocean currents. When the currents don't up well, when the cold currents don't rise to the surface, carrying nutrients to create phytoplankton, it doesn't exist. When we kill whales that also create the nutrients for phytoplankton, we are killing ourselves. If, 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 when the G20 met in Brisbane three months ago, uh, Brisbane, Australia, and they don't address the plastics that are going into our, our oceans and the poaching that is taking place in our oceans right now, we're wasting valuable time. We know that the current prolonged global, global loot of the oceans must end. Every, every year we are extracting 122 Empire State buildings worth of life crammed into our oceans. Mm -hmm. If we continue along the same line, somewhere in the fourth decade of the 20th century, my colleagues have put out a paper that say the oceans will be lifeless. This is an SOS call of epic proportion, and we each have, uh, we each are required to lend a helping hand. What no longer do we make telephone calls or emails. We each write a letter to our elected official. Write a letter because it's logged in when it's received, and we... We implore our elected officials to create 80% of our ocean worldwide into a marine protected no-take zone with stiff penalties, with policing, and, and, and long, long-term jail sentences for people that are killing sea life. 
Uh, Dr. Reese, is there a place where folks can go online to get that wording that you just gave us, writing a letter to our congressman asking for 80 percent of ocean and marine protection? Uh, and Absolutely, to be no take you zones. can. Treat yourself to easily the best book I've ever written, drreese.com, D-R-Reese, R-E-E-S-E dot com, Shepherding the Sea, the Race to Save Our Oceans. Look, I, I, here in a nutshell, for every problem, there's at least three solutions. Human beings are exceptional problem solvers, and we're elegant tool makers. That's what we do. And, and by, by focusing on the, on the immediate crisis of our ocean, we can turn this around. Our children are begging us to turn it around. The strongest pain, cancer, and heart medicines come from our coral reefs. Our coral reefs are dying. 50% of them are dead. Mm. The size of England is dead off the coast of Queensland and the Great Barrier Reef, the largest reef on the globe. We have it within us to turn it around because if our elected officials don't take heed, we can vote them out of power. Until the tree policy comes. Together, if we band together, we can move mountains. America put the first man on the moon. We we have to take the first step. China's not going to lead us. They will follow America has it in our power to make our children's future illustrious and bright. And, and by respecting the oceans, we have it in us, Juliana. We can't sit back now. We must take that first leadership step. Dr. Reese, your book, Shepherding to Save the Sea, is that the, that's the title? Shepherding the Sea, the, the Race to Save Our Ocean. The Race to Save Our Ocean. Um, I lived on the sea here in New York City. When you think about the sea, you really don't. When you think about New York City, you don't often think about living right on the ocean. But there is a lot of coastline. And for a while, I lived in Queens right on the ocean. And I, I've talked about this at the beginning of the show six months ago when the show started that uh, they started to drop uh, drilling equipment down and uh, putting in pipelines to carry liquefied natural ga- gas off the coast of uh, our very own New York City. It was, I know. it was horrible. Okay. So just, it looked like, it looked like the um, Gulf of Mexico, which yeah. is a sad, even to have to make a comparison like that, 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 that the Gulf of Mexico has been so destroyed. And, yes. and, uh, I went to some of these meetings where the uh, the gas companies and the companies involved would not wait until the mating season of an endangered turtle was over in order to they first they agreed to do it then everyone went home then they said oh wait no we have to do it right now we need this money this fracking we need this pipeline immediately they they have zero they don't care about the sea at all. And I don't understand how I'm sure you've come across these folks in your in your talks and in your in your world. I don't understand how people can't see that um, continuing this on this path is is to their own destruction and to the destruction of their own children. How is that possible? I want to be very candid. I'll tell you why. There's three things. Number one, they're being paid ungodly sums of money. Mm. Number two, they have no respect for nature. The strength of an ecosystem depends on the abundance of its biodiversity, and all the biodiversity works together. It's all interconnected. There's no unemployment. Everyone eats. Every thing works together. Mm. And it is the most perfect system that we are aware of on Earth. So why not mimic it? Let's protect it and let's mimic it. We know that we can harness ocean waves without killing everything. We know that we can make jobs, that we can promote innovation. We have in America the greatest brain power in our colleges 
a pound for pound of any country in the world. Let us roll up our sleeves and let my colleagues at it. Do you realize, and the listeners must understand this, that when they go offshore to seismically slaughter all my sea life, all our sea life, they're being reimbursed 100%. This isn't business. This is some 200-year-old payback loot. They are looting our biosphere, and they're being paid for it. With our tax what? dollars. Oh, it's, my it's money. awful. In my name. And, I, you know, I, I'm standing up. Look, David beat Goliath because David was smart, and he used his brain and a tool that he innovated. Big oil is killing the earth. They have nothing vested in the future. Their days are numbered. And if if the commander-in-chief won't stand up to them, I'll stand up to them. Somebody in America has got to tell the truth, and somebody's got to protect nature and our children. Because this is the biggest crisis in the history of our race. It's now or never. The line is on the sand. Dr. Reese, in addition to our listeners writing a letter to their congresspeople and their elected officials, what else can we do in our lives? Well, there's a number of things. Here are some very hard facts. In 2002, when we surveyed Americans, we were using, we were using about 227 pounds of plastic for personal use products. When my colleagues went back and sampled a decade later, that had, that's gone up to over almost 350 pounds of plastic per person for personal care products. Please. Like deodorant? Pulse, pulse down. <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? Personal care products like deodorant? Personal care and... products. Hmm. Please consider becoming a vegetarian or at least scaling back the amount of animal products. Uh, try, try going vegetarian once a week. Try it several times a week. You'll find that it's delicious. <laughs> it's delightful. Dr. Reese, also... tell, tell the people why that is important, because I don't know. I mean, I, I know because I was a vegetarian, and uh, what first turned me on to becoming an activist was, uh, de- uh, I think, John Robbins' book, um, Diet for a New America, I somehow yeah. fell into my hands when I was 18, and I never looked back. Uh, and, right on. And... Um, but but could you tell the audience who might not know why is it important to eat lower on that food chain? Why is it why does it help the environment to be in? Okay, well the the, the 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 first thing is sadly but true, the oceans are one hundred percent toxic. They, 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 the, the United Nations has done the math. There's there's at least forty six thousand pieces of plastic for every square kilometer of the ocean. It, it, the, the whole thing is plastic. Now, when the, the plastic goes into the ocean, it breaks down into little con- pieces of confetti. Those little pieces of confetti look like roe or little eggs, and all sea life is consuming it. As I had mentioned earlier, all pl- the tiny bits of plastic are the most perfect sponge. They're laced with toxicity. So uh, whether it's methylmercury, whether it's DDT, whether it's PCBs or insecticides or any number of other toxins, as, that, as the little fish is eaten by the bigger fish and so on and so forth, and you go up the food chain, the sharks, the whales, human beings, we are apex predators. So that little bit of poison that started at the bottom of the food chain with a minnow is now at least 100,000 times stronger when a human being has fish or anything from the sea. This is a crisis. On, and, and, and on land, it's, it's equally a problem because the animals are, are, are hit with pylosine. They're, they're get, it, this is how backwards it is. We give animals in America antibiotics so they won't get sick. Hello? <laughs> And all of that is in the food chain, whether it's your milk, whether it's your cheese. You are eating a little bit of poison that's biomagnified up. Dr. Reese, I I think uh, in addition, the thing that really always got me was this argument that if if I'm eating lettuce, it only took, 
you know, a tiny plot of land to not that as vegetarians, you only eat lettuce. But, you know, if I'm eating lower on the food chain, it takes less resources to make that yeah, food for me water. to eat. So, yeah, it's poisoning me. But also, I mean, you know, the, the eating higher on the food chain poisons you and concentrates the poison in your system and into your food. But eating lower on the food chain, it has less of an, uh, less of a carbon impact, less of an environmental yeah. impact. That's and, and, let, and, and let's let's cut right to the chase. Uh, many of our brethren in our nation suffer from coronary disease. You are what you eat. Mm. I strongly encourage people to nuts, berries, seeds, and lots of organic veggies and, and fruit, and just eat graze very lightly is all I can say. Because here's the listeners know this better than me. If you wake up in the morning, Juliana, and, and you feel good and you have your health, You've won the lottery of life. And when your feet hit the ground, if you're not excited to jump out of bed and do something cool, change it up. Because the most, impre- the most precious thing we have is time. And we have no time to waste. Each of us, my, each of us are required to lend a helping hand. Get away from plastic. Buy yourself four organic cotton bags and shop with them. Get away from plastic. It's everywhere, and it's subsidized. Three and a half million barrels of oil a day are going into plastic. The time is now to say no. I think that's a really important point, because we think about uh, limiting our oil consumption, limiting our driving. I mean, a lot of people in New York don't drive. We have a good public transit, or good enough. Took me forever to get here. Public transit system here in New York City. Um, so, the, But the idea of limiting plastic as another way to yet, uh, another way to decrease demand for these oil uh, products that's very, yeah, very important. and you know, the, the best thing is, here's the thing what I'm, I'm focused on. I'm focused on kids because they get it, and kids take the message home. So many, many New Yorkers live in apartments. I get that. Some have balconies. If you've got a balcony, get a couple pots. In your pots, grow tomatoes and peppers. That attracts my friends, the bees, the bumblebees, the honeybees. And the kid, kids, in a matter of four or five weeks, can watch nature grow bounty. We can reconnect our kids with the earth. Kids are natural ecologists. They know society turns them into sociopathic consumers that buy crap that winds up in our landfill 18 months later. And most of it's plastic. We need to we need to dial back down. We need to reduce and we need to reuse and we need to get smart in America. We're smart. And we somehow have become, we've moved away from being thrifty. You know, during the Depression, my, my parents, the rest in, in, in heaven peacefully, their families, our families were thrifty. We made brooms that lasted 20 years in America. We never threw anything away because in nature, nature mm-hmm. doesn't throw anything away. We've got to get back to the basics here We've got this great chance. We live on this exquisite planet. It's home. It's my home. It's our home. And we can't wreck it because we don't have another home. Dr. Reese, you've been on MSNBC and uh, other news outlets. Have you been on Fox News? <laughs> Be fair and balanced, people. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, Sir Rupert doesn't like the the uh, the. Sir Rupert knows who I am, but he doesn't like He's my uh, my colors. Uh, I'm for planet Earth. I'm for kids. I'm for the animals. And no, I'm not for uh, for uh, 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 flummery and 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 bunk. How have and you no been? Way. How have you been received even on MSNBC? I often, I mean, MSNBC is often, you know, it's for gay marriage and it's for equality uh, in, in this way and that way. But it's still a corporate news network. And after Rachel, when Rachel Maddow or Chris Hayes goes to break, uh, the commercials are all for fracking. Well, I, I, yeah, that I, I don't know, but I do know on my uh, on Ed Schultz's show, the Ed Show. I love it. Ed. Ed and I get along like a house on fire, and they and they <laughs> let me go wild. They, they he, Ed, Ed let and, and and you know because here's the thing: the truth hurts, 
and I'm passionate. I love this planet. I have been all over our globe. I've been under the seas. I've been at the top of mountains. I've been in deserts. I had a great show on PBS, Dr. Reese's Planet, and we went all across the West. I'm not afraid to, to tell people the problem because for every problem, there's at least three solutions. And if this is just about turning a dime, we can turn a dime. The Googles of the world, the Intels of the world, they care about tomorrow. They're not destroying the world. They want a better place. And so it means changing it up. But here, here, here it is in a nutshell, Juliana. Change is opportunity in disguise. Life is filled with change. We, it's good. It's cool. It's fun. It challenges us. Dr. Reese, let me make sure. Will you repeat the name of your book? Because we're coming to the end of our time here, and I do appreciate you coming on. But just so our listeners have the exact title, could you repeat the name of your book, please? Yeah, it's Shepherding the Sea, the Race. To save our oceans, and you, you can, can come to my website, Dr. Reese, D R Reese, R E E S E dot com. Uh, right on the home page, there's a link, and it's a great book. And and you, and I blog, and you can reach out to me, and and you can watch me on the Ed Show, Dr. Reese. Thank you so much for your impassioned work, and thanks for being on our show. Dr. Reese is a distinguished conservation biologist, earth doctor, award-winning broadcaster, and the voice, a voice, and a great one, I, I might add, for preservation of our planet and our ecology. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Please protect our planet. I'm working on that. You're listening to the Juliana Forlano Show. I'm Juliana Forlano. I got to tell you, that was very impassioned. It was. It it kind of did get me fired up. Um, um, first, I was like... Well, when you hopeless. ripped your shirt off in the middle you know, of it. I was <laughs> hopeless. And then I turned around and said, well, well wait a minute. I, I really feel like I absolutely have to do something with regard to saving the earth. Not that I didn't already feel that way. Very exciting guest. It, it made me think about becoming a vegetarian again because I was for 10 or 12 years and then I kind of eroded back. I married a mainstream person and I eroded back to being it's just uh, I tried to be as as uh, mm-hmm. as responsible with the meat eating as possible, but well, you could still, you know, stop using the plastic bags. Yeah, you can get glass containers. You know, I think not using plastic is a big deal. I really think that uh, lobbying our elected officials and keeping the pressure on our elected officials, because as many uh, non as many not plastic bags that I use, I see floating down the street and getting caught in the tree next door, like you know. Hundreds, there's bags everywhere. So, I, yes, it would be great if I can personally be responsible for my own consumption. But at the same time, I do think that, that people of conscience need to put pressure on this system. You've got some jerk who works at Caterpillar or who owns Caterpillar, the company, mm-hmm. telling 17,000 people to write a letter. And they all did it because, whatever, they did it on their work time. They sent the letter. Maybe the workplace was saying you're not getting your check until the letter goes out. I don't know. They have ways of doing things, but that's documented. 17,500 letters to elected officials. Well, see, this is why. And we got to do this ourselves. We have to be, we have to pressure. We have to pressure. We have to, but this is why it's a beautiful thing to have this radio station, to have this radio show, to be able to bring this guest on, Dr. Reese Halter, so that people can know how vital their actions are, that they can make a difference by writing those letters. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't think people really realize what's happening in the media landscape in terms of the consolidation of media. There used to be, uh, you know, a number of radio channels all over the place where you could hear progressive and then and then subversive, beyond progressive, subversive radio, right? WBAI. Mm-hmm. All over the landscape, there was, you know, middle of the road folks, left, a little bit left, far left. Now it's really basically corporate radio. There's NPR, which is co- corporate you know, radio, <laughs> right? Corporate uh, radio, light. national nationalist public radio. <laughs> um, there's NPR, and there, and then all of Clear Channel, all of Premier Radio networks. Anything you hear anywhere else that's ba- that's not Pacifica or a small, like an AM channel here or there, is not talking about this stuff. And when they do, they disparage it, like. Like, it's not cool to care love. It's not cool to love animals. It's not cool to care about each other. Or and- they'll, they'll dispute the science. And yeah. they'll say, oh, this is your opinion. You know, we have to give the opposing opinion. And then it brings back in the corporate view. 
You know, I was so glad to have Dr. Reese on the show because after reading about the killer whales, um, killer whales have a special place in my heart. Uh, mm-hmm. And I hate to say this because I don't support this this place anymore. But when I was young, my very regular, not, you know, radical parents, uh, working class parents brought us to SeaWorld. There's a SeaWorld mm-hmm. in, um, I think it's, it's got to be somewhere near Canada because I grew up in upstate New York and going to Canada was where we went. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there was a SeaWorld there with, or, you know, some kind of SeaWorld with the orcas. And I just fell in love and we bought, they bought me this big blow up orca. And it deflated in the hot trunk on the way home, and I was bereft to open up that trunk. I wanted to hold it the whole way uh, in the back seat. My father was like, no, let's put it in the trunk. And I, 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 you know, they had to pry it out of my, not cold, dead hands, but they had to pry it out of my warm childhood hands, Mm -hmm. and they put it in the trunk. And when they opened the trunk, it was two hours later when we got home, it was all deflated. And I have to say, it was a formative moment. Um, They blew it back up. It was fine. But when you're a kid, that's a big deal. You mm-hmm. fall in love with particular animals. And uh, I really don't support animals in captivity, especially the way they train them. I don't science or no science. Mm-hmm. That's science. They always say, oh, well, we're doing science and we're helping the animals. No, you're not. You're by torturing them. I don't not this. Not in this case. Not in this case. Um, go watch Blackfish if you want to really be depressed. But when I read about the, the this um, these orcas and the fact that they're going to be extinct, I just, it hit me right in that that spot of, oh my God, I have to do more. What can I do? That's the only thing, you know, I think we feel so powerless and I think the mainstream media keeps us feeling powerless. It bombards us with stories and never tells us what we can go do. You know, I cannot stop the oceans from, from the Japanese from killing, you know, whales right now. But what I can do is I can write that letter. So I did my part. I'm not, I don't have to do everyone's part. I can mm-hmm. just do my part. You know, maybe we'll make the change, but if we don't, I want to go down fighting, saying I I did my part. You, you know? did what you could. Yeah, so and I, I think a lot of people feel that way, and that's a good way of motivating your listeners to say, "That's the value. You're being given the opportunity to say I can change the world. It doesn't take a lot. I just have to do my part." And that's it for today. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Reese Halter, the distinguished conservation biologist. Boy, he was really a powerful speaker. Great to have him on. You can find out more information about his work and his book at drreese.com. Join us tomorrow. Same time, same station. We have comedian Leanne Lord joining us in the studio and also feminist and actress Katie Goodman joins us for our very first segment, Reports from Vegistan. Don't miss it on the Juliana Forlano Show. Good night.